Okay, so we're here to, to discuss social video and how it's going to change the way you create content. So I'm going to have everybody briefly introduce themselves real quick. Steve? Oh, I'm Steve Helmuth. I'm the EVP of uh, media um, operations and technology. So I don't run our social media effort. So, uh, but Sam Farber and Melissa Brenner that I would have had sit in this seat uh, are actually on the West Coast visiting with the likely candidates. So, um, but uh, what I do is I handle the enterprise at um, the NBA and provide them with all their own raw materials. And I'll talk a little bit today about uh, what we did with uh, Mobile View, about what we did specifically for NBA games. Yep. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Neil A. Shah. I oversee all of digital and social for the New York Giants. This is my 15th season with the team. Um, and all content, all video content, social content, all kind of filters through me, and then I report up to my boss who all, we're set up a little bit differently. All of our content runs through one department. So our game day presentation, our publications, our social, digital, radio, all filters in through one um, roof, which makes it a lot easier to get content across the board. You work with Don Sperling? Nice. Yes. Sorry to hear that. Okay. <laughs> we love Don. Don's the best. Lindsay? Uh, I'm Lindsay Signor. I oversee social strategy for the NBC Sports Group. So that includes Sunday Night Football, NASCAR, um, the Olympics, Thursday Night Football, Notre Dame, our, our whole swath of properties. Um, and we actually roll into a newly formed consumer engagement group, which is kind of a fancy name for marketing. Um, but it's exciting for us because we get to be a hub for content between the digital team, the production team, um, even radio, our creative services team with promos and, and design work and that kind of thing. So we have the opportunity to take everything that NBC Sports has to offer and roll it out socially throughout all of our sports. Scott? Yeah, I'm Scott Warfield. I uh, head up social media for NASCAR, which uh, at the sanctioning body consists of a, a content team and a newly formed partner engagement team, which is um, a handful of folks that are uh, fully devoted to working with our partners on how to leverage social in our sport, which um, talking to some other leagues is a, a, a pretty interesting take on uh, the, the partner relationship. Great. Well, we're going to start with, uh, with a little bit of a sizzle reel, since people are still filtering in, um, of the NBC Olympics. Now, this was put together by, for Dave Mazza, who was supposed to be here this morning, but he's stuck in OBS meetings and trying to get over to Spain. I guess he didn't make it over there yet. So let's run the sizzle reel from the Olympics. And I stole we'll... the sizzle reel. Um, I hope you enjoy it. It has nothing to do with social media at all. <laughs> Olympic Stadium is the site for the men's 100 meter final and David Brown knows that everyone else is out to get him. Set. The expectation is enormous. The pressure as well. Is this the coronation? Four years in the making. Take your mark. Here we go again, one last time for the agent. Boa noite, Brazil. Here we stand. The people who have came before me and it's for all the people after me who believe they can't do it who can do it. That is an Olympic gold medal winning moment. It's like we're in a movie or it's like a dream. It was just such a magical night. We have the final line! Michelle Conkley has the gold. I just knew how bad I wanted this and just brought it home with everything I had. The world don't speak that little kick out the lead that she's gonna win it. She did it! Superman, Thor, you put them all together. He's better than all of them. Michael Phelps. This isn't even close. Michael Phelps is swimming away from everybody. Well, the greatest of all time just did it again. It's not the end of a career. It's the beginning of a new journey. And there's the guy. Bolt jumps out of the box and immediately goes to the front. You say Bolt, still invincible. Number one, number that. Ever 
see Gwen Jorgensen just say Rio. It's jubilation. Here we stand and deliver history. Not that far away. 14 months, right? 13 months. 13 months. So uh, that's a great video. I think it kind of obviously tees up a lot of the stories that you were telling. So maybe just talk about the well, how big your team was and just kind of walk people through because it was a pretty amazing effort. You, know, you were lucky you were located right next to the coffee, the McDonald's coffee, so that was perfect for you guys. But uh, how big was your team and how you kind of, every day, how did you kind of come in and kind of figure out how you're going to go about creating social video and creating buzzes? And sure. So I think um, to start leading into this Olympics, we had a lot of new tools at our disposal across the social network. So Facebook Live, uh, Instagram Stories, Snapchat, uh, Twitter Moments, all of these sort of video-driven products did not exist in Sochi. Um, Instagram Stories, I think, actually rolled out like the week of the week before the Olympics. So we, we sort of played around with that, didn't necessarily have a strategy yet. Um, but for us, the one really cool thing about Rio, or one of the really cool things about Rio, is that we had the ability to distribute highlights on social for the first time ever. Um, and we had over 600 million video views on highlights alone um, during the two weeks of the Olympics, which is pretty insane. Um, and I think with building a strategy and a team, um, we really do everything internally. Uh, we use agencies and, and some thought leaders and around a lot of our sports, but. The Olympics is a really unique event, um, and you really sort of have to know the ins and outs of, of how it all works, the storylines. We have researchers that go around the world and are following these athletes for years um, to really try to find and understand why you at home will like them, because you probably don't regularly watch competitive swimming um, or competitive beach volleyball. And so um, we have a lot of assets within our uh, larger organization that allows us to really prepare for these storylines but at the end of the day the the athletes and and what's going on is in real time and so we build our strategy the way that we wanted to use social video was with high-end design work um, even some things is just animated tune-in images I think there's a lot going on um, during the Olympics there's a lot on um, we are live streaming every sport there's stuff on multiple channels and so our job is to really come up with creative ways, not only to inform people of where they can watch all of this stuff, um, but also give them the best tidbits. And a lot of that was through social video with the highlights. Um, we had some animations that were created. We had a lot of reactionary stuff. So um, if you weren't able to see something in real time, uh, whether it was on TV or within a live stream, and we are going to uh, reshow that in Prime, we give you reasons to want to watch it again um, through a bunch of different variables, but a lot of what we focused on was social video because of all of these new tools. Um, and quite frankly, especially on Facebook, it, it gets us the furthest in terms of reaching the most people by trying to give people as much video as we can. So what, is, what were two or three of your favorite social moments that you think kind of resonated in? Were they highlights? I mean, a lot of things weren't even highlights that kind of caught fire, like Michael Phelps his face and yeah Phelps face was a fun one um, I think our most watched video was actually um, a two women's soccer players I think that played for Brazil uh, one like had the water bottle the wrong way which is like an old gimmick I don't know um, but those are the kinds of things when you like lay out the strategy and that's the one thing that got like 20 million views you kind of wonder um, sometimes but that was a really popular one, and, and honestly, um, just about anything Simone Biles did, um, just about anything we, we put out there, I mean, we were doing Throwback Thursday uh, videos of her routine just because we knew they were performing really well, and so um, she was really, really fun to watch. And we also, um, one of my favorite things that we did, we did um, this series called Athletes in Cars Getting Their Medals. So we would go live, we have this whole, um, sort of road show when a, an Olympian wins a medal they come to the International Broadcast Center they may get interviewed with Bob they may go to the Today Show that kind of thing on that tour uh, you stop with the social team but we wanted to do something unique where you know we're one of the first people that get to see their medals sometimes these athletes don't even see their parents until they get to our um, our location and so we had them go live in the car with their medals 
right after, you know, they went through doping and all that stuff, the first thing they did was get into the van and go live on Facebook. And for some of them, they were in shock. They were with their family, with their teammates, and it was really, really fun. And I think something we'd love to replicate with other sports. And it was as simple as, as a phone. It wasn't simple, uh, as, simple as a phone, yep. And I think, uh, you know, Nile, let's talk about, maybe let's cue up uh, Nile's, Nile's videos, because I think Nile wants to make the point that sometimes the gorilla videos are the best. So we have two quick clips, um, so let's roll those. Maybe you can talk over this one since this is, there is no audio on this one. You want to tell what we have here on? Yeah, I mean, I think you guys have all seen sort of the mannequin challenge and, and, and the viral nature in which that, uh, you know, kind of took off. So after one of our wins uh, in October, you know, we got all the players and our, um, our, le our lead video guys said, you know, let's get all the players to do this. Um, so we got our front office, our owners, um, all 53 players, our equipment guys to sort of coordinate this all in – um, you know, a one-minute span, and I think the beauty of this is, you know, this was a spur of the moment. This was a, a trending, you know, moment that we knew we had to capitalize on, and that video got over six million views in the first, you know, I think two and a half hours um, that when, it, when it, that we posted it, and it really showed that sometimes you could have the best thought out, creative, best produced item, but sometimes if you can capitalize on a trending topic, those are some of your best moments, and, and that was really a, a good example of everyone working together and, and coordinating and getting something out that we knew was, had to happen in a timely fashion. Well, this is for maybe Scott. You can bring jump in here. You know, given and Lindsay, you said the same thing. Some of these things you didn't quite know that they would be the hits that they were. So since you can't really, you know, simply identify what's going to be a hit, then therefore, you can't, how do you even use editorial judgment? Because sometimes your editorial judgment could be wrong on what could be a hit. It could be the the dumbest thing that people just resonate. So Scott, from an, you know, from a NASCAR perspective. Um, you know, how do you kind of look through social moments, if you will, and figure out which ones will resonate? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. For us, you know, we, we have a fan and media engagement center uh, down in our Charlotte facility that's powered by HP that we staff pretty much 24-7. Uh, and it's a listening and monitoring uh, component to, to what we do. So really out of the gate, when we see a piece of content that is performing well, we'll know it within a, a couple of minutes. Uh, it's real-time plug-ins to all the social platforms. So we're able to act pretty quickly, say, let's put some money behind this. Let's build another piece of content to support that. Um, so really for us, it, 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 the, it all comes from the analytics and the, the measurement. Um, yes, from a trending standpoint, uh, what's happening in pop culture, but um, in our world, I think that, that analytical um, look at uh, the content is, is, is really kind of how we're setting ourselves up for success. So you used Facebook Live at the last race in a big way, right, I believe? So talk about that a little bit, Facebook Live and that strategy. Yeah, we did, and we don't have a video of it. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, we, we work closely with our broadcast partners in NBC um, internally as well. Um, and we, we had a Facebook Live of Tony Stewart, one of our icons uh, in our sport. It was his final race in Homestead, Miami. Um, and we thought, uh, what better way to, to send him off than to – have his in-car camera available to his millions of fans on, on Facebook. So um, that product is usually, our in-car camera is uh, usually featured on a broadcast um, on our NASCAR.com platform. But like Lindsay was saying, uh, the reach we're able to get out of Facebook Live and such a unique um, uh, uh, execution with Facebook Live. Facebook was fantastic to work with on this. We did a million and a half views um, of Tony Stewart driving around in circles for three and a half hours. Um, wasn't in a major incident, um, was around a lot of wrecks, but a, a completely different look at our, our biggest event uh, and something that uh, we think we can, be, can be replicated in a pretty unique way. Now, Facebook Live, um, 
we did a, we did a boot camp out in in Los Angeles, and I watched them do a presentation over in uh, Sports Hell in Monaco. And you know the viral nature of you know that you, you can hit somebody with a hundred who has a hundred followers, and then they can like that video, and then they and the next thing you know, it just mushrooms. I guess much like that six million number. So what you know, how do you kind of how quickly does do these things? spread like wildfire? Do some things take a, long, a lot while to linger or is it pretty much a moment to moment it's going to hit real quick and shared real quick? Uh, I, think it's, I think it varies by, by the type of content. I mean, we have a good uh, case study on Facebook Live where when that first started, uh, you know, to, to Scott's point, we knew the reach would be significantly higher because you do get a notification anytime you do go live. But we saw a 30% daily unlike rate because people were getting annoyed by the fact that they would constantly see those notifications because we started streaming our daily video show that we do because we thought, hey, we could increase our, our viewership substantially. So I think the, the thing for us was we realized, you know, to kind of what Scott did, we only use Facebook Live now when we know um, it's a unique, it's, it's sort of behind the scenes, and we use it that way to make sure that people will say, hey, this isn't a, the same thing that they're doing all the time. And we just, uh, the NFL recently allowed us to use Facebook Live on game day. So now, I'm sure some of you have seen Odell Beckham does a pregame warm-up where he catches the ball with one hand. And before, we used to cut that video um, using Live View and Snappy TV, and we'd post it, you know, maybe like 10 minutes after the fact. Now we Facebook Live that. People want to see it. It's an exclusive behind the scenes. If you're at the game, you can see it. But if you're home, that's the only place you can get that in real time is through our Facebook page. So I think the finding something that's unique definitely helps your chances. So in general, I mean, the social media platforms, um, what, what one is best suited for what kind of content? You know, which one's best for long form content? Which one's best for the, the, the GIFs and the, and the super short clips? Is there, a, is there a, any sort of method to the madness? Yeah, I mean, I think we're finding the more that we test, the more that we know. Obviously, I think for us, YouTube seems to be the right place for longer form content. Um, even in just testing in the last week of a few different 15 and 30 second NFL related promos. So promos don't always work for us um, on social, but when it's the NFL, it's good content and, and people want to see those types of highlights. And so um, we found that more people are consuming the 15 second length, um, even though there's more stuff, good stuff in a 30 second promo. Um, but I think for us, YouTube seems to be the place for the longer form. We've tested various lengths on Facebook and the only thing we've seen where it's a, a comparable completion is around the Olympics, and I think that's something where people just for those two weeks cannot get enough Olympics, and they will watch what, just about whatever we put out there. Um, but for the most part, that's where we're seeing that we're, we are tailoring back a little bit on uh, the length of our Facebook video, and even as it pertains to Facebook Lives, the ones where it's a, you know, a fantasy football update or something where fans know that they can get questions answered or a, um, a Q&A with one of our talent, um, they seem to sit longer for that, but not necessarily uh, if we're doing interviews and things like that. Scott. Yeah, I'd just add, we, I, we found some success with long form on, on Facebook. We did a... Um, a three-part mini-series that uh, Doc, you follow with the 78 team, Martin Truex Jr. For those unfamiliar, he's kind of our Cinderella. He's a one-car team. His uh, significant other has, has cancer and, and great human interest story. And we trailed him and, and, and Sherry from the checkered flag at Talladega to the green flag the following week at Martinsville. So I think, you know, that kind of behind the scenes, what goes into a week um, you could probably see that on a, a NASCAR America show, that, that 15 minutes in length that we broke up into three five-minute episodes, but uh, tremendous destination viewing that we're able to promote across other platforms, drive people to Facebook to see these three five-minute shows. Again, based on the content of a little bit more lifestyle, we were able to hold the audience kind of through those full 15 minutes. And how about yeah, the Giants fans? Yeah, um, you know, the platform themselves have limitations for instance, for. For instance, Instagram, you can only have a minute video. They up that up from 30 seconds. So Facebook typically is where we host our, our longer form stuff. And we use those other platforms as promotional vehicles to get back to Facebook. Um, you know, we do a weekly sights and sounds uh, feature, which is basically our camera guys shooting footage from the game, from behind the bench, from the end zones. That video averages around five and a half to six minutes is our best you know, video that people watch on a weekly basis. So we cut a 30 second spot for it to tease on Instagram. Uh, we get something up on Snapchat, and it all links back to our Facebook page um, just because of platform limitations. But I think the, the thing that we've kind of realized this year and 
you know, we used to always take our TV shows, cut them up, and post them up on social. Now we really have a social plan where we cut videos specifically for each platform. So we have Instagram specific videos, we have Facebook specific videos, and Twitter specific videos. And our engagement numbers have increased significantly because we took that strategy this year. So Steve, you know, the, the theme is how social video will change the way you create content. And obviously social content, a lot of it is consumed on, well, it's not on big screens. It's on small screens, you know, handheld yeah, phones. Small screens without audio, I guess, like, what, what you, what's the 70% what's the of the people that use social media don't even, never turn up the audio. Right. Right. So, so I know you guys took some steps this year to, a uh, pretty big step, actually. I mean, pretty good commitment to yeah. make the, the small screen video experience better. So can, I mean, that's one way of changing content yeah. creation. So. Can you explain that? So, first of all, thanks to many people in this room, you know, that helped make the mobile view possible. Um, actually, I don't know if you guys remember Qualcomm MediaFlow. It was, do you remember it actually? It was, it was actually the first mobile video platform. So, I was working with Mike Connolly, who was at the uh, Phoenix Suns then. So, we started experimenting with substituting the main camera. This is like, this is like eight years ago. Substituting the main camera for a tighter camera one for mobile, because back then the, the video quality was so poor that the wide shot just didn't even register. So, so we experimented with that. Then the, the uh, social and the digital media team came to me and said, Steve, we need, something, we need something specific for mobile. And I said, I got it. What we're going to do is this. We're going we're to put a camera in every venue. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna background switch it, you know, um, using bus linking in the mobile unit. We're going to send a separate feed back to the NBA. And, um, and we ran a few tests, and everybody bought in, and here we are. So we actually, the NBA has a camera person um, at every game uh, doing this for us. The real, the real, besides the viewing improvement, which is huge um, on a small screen. How much tighter is the shot, um, roughly? I would say what we say to them is we say follow the ball on about six or seven players. You don't have to, you don't have to widen out to get everybody. And whenever they take a shot, we tell them widen out to include the basket so that you get the rebound and any action of the basket. And, and, uh, and the camera people love it because they're doing a game without a director in their ear. <laughs> so that's huge. Uh, if you can imagine the lives that they lead, uh, with, uh, uh, and you know the lives that they lead. So, um, so we've, we've gradually coached them into it. We'll talk to them when necessary during the game. But for the most part, uh, they're their own director. You know, they do their own job. And of course, the, the huge upside to having that program is that those are the highlights that we use in social media. You know, we, we cut all of our highlight packages from that feed, from that tighter camera one. And it makes our highlight packages work so much better across the board. So, so for all of you, I mean, you know, in general, I mean, it seems that what I, what, what I find challenging about social videos, you know, it's, it's like the internet, you know, we have this problem with our print stuff. You know, there's no end to the, there's no end, you know, not, you don't have 30 ad pages, so you need 30 pages of editorial. You have like limitless, bottomless pit of content creation. So how do you kind of put your energies in the right place? Um, what is the relationship with the broadcast teams and with uh, your social teams? How do they all get along? Because I know that could be a tension there as well. So uh, from, the, uh, from, from the Giants perspective, you know, we're set up, I mentioned it a little bit in the intro, and it's unlike a lot of teams, and a lot of teams are shifting towards this model, is that our broadcasts, our digital, our game presentation, we're all under one roof. So the advantage to that is there's brand consistency across the board. So the same guys that are shooting and editing videos for TV are the same ones that are doing it for me on the web. Um, and I think from a scaling perspective, we're able to crank out. We do about 65 to 70 videos a week across all of our platforms. We have seven TV shows. And um, the ability to have those same editors helps everyone because, again, if you're going to the Giants Facebook page or you're watching a TV show, from a look and creative standpoint, everything you know looks the same. So do you have a pretty steady list of deliverables, like you know, in terms of amount of, amounts of content? So yeah. So we, I mean, our, our schedule in season is is pretty set um, because the TV shows are there, our, our game previews, our digital content is there. The only thing that really is different is kind of like that mannequin challenge and these social videos that you know we're ready on the spot to create anything. Everything we do is done in house. We have no outside agencies. We have full production in house, studio in house. Um, so we have the ability to crank out anything at, at, at any time. And the thing that is different about the NFL, and I guess every, you know, every, every league is the same, is that there is no offseason anymore in the NFL. Football content is 365. The draft is as equally as important as you know, a game in season. So we're constantly looking for content, and, and that's our job. 
I think on the NBC Sports side, I alluded to it at the beginning, but we really, we are a multimedia company, and so we have a lot of assets throughout the company, whether it's news and information from the site, whether it's um, highlights on our website, whether it's uh, time with our talent or stuff from the broadcast. And I think what the entire company has embraced is that um, social media is a really great way to distribute all of this type of content. And I think we work very closely across the board to make sure that we know what's available to us. Um, and then we can make requests to actually have that content created specifically for social. So a beautifully shot on-air feature may work really well on social. It actually may not work at all. And so um, we look to try to test all kinds of stuff with, with whether it's um, something for on-air or something for the website, and including original things that we're doing with our talent or that are social first. Um, we're actually doing something next week. We're rolling out a claymation video. We have, uh, I think, four NFL games next week. Um, that we're broadcasting, and so we have this sort of claymation-themed Christmas video that we made specifically for social that um, on air is actually going to run as a promo. And so it, it kind of goes both ways, but overall, I think we've gotten really good about sharing information, what's available to us, even so much as, you know, a PA is setting up an interview with Sidney Crosby. Um, we'll know about that, so if, if we have one extra minute um, with him, could we do a rapid fire, uh, he probably wouldn't do this, but uh, like a rapid fire Snapchat filters that, or lenses kind of thing. Um, but he's great, but I don't think he would do that. Um, but those are the kinds of things as we know them, um, we can also make requests in advance versus sort of getting that interview after and it may not play well um, because to Steve's point, it's people may not uh, watch a muted interview. Um, but also, I work really closely with, with um, both Millet and Scott in terms of sharing uh, assets across the leagues and the teams as well, um, because we all have one common goal, which is consumption of the product. And so we want people to watch that Giants-Dallas um, game just as much as Millet wants them to win and wants people to watch as well. And so um, we also share assets uh, with the teams and the leagues. I, I think what you're hearing, which, and what I think is pretty interesting, is just this paradigm shift in the last several years where, you know, social always was that kind of glom on, create this for TV, hey, make sure social has it to push out, um, at, at least at NASCAR, and it sounds like from, from the rest up here, we now have a seat at the table, right? So social is its own business unit alongside digital, alongside marketing, um, we're, we're at the forefront, we completely switched how we market where we went to a social first marketing strategy. So um, always gonna have 30 second TV spots, always have a ton of inventory in the race broadcast, uh, but we're now creating, we're going to agencies and, and in house, we're building an entire season launch campaign right now that leads with social media. And then we back into TV instead of vice versa, which is um, pretty, pretty unique, at least what I've seen in the sports world the last three, four years. Yeah, so we, um, we rebuilt our entire um, logging and editing facility over the summer. Um, and um, what we did was we set up a situation where our loggers no longer log, they just tag things, right, with significant tags. And they're throwing them to social media editors so they can immediately turn those plays that they tag around. Um, and then on top of that, we have a flow of edited highlights coming in from WSC. I think you, the WSC is an automated highlight, uh, highlight uh, production system. So that, you know, if we want all of Paul Gaskell's, you know, you know uh, uh, scoring plays for an entire game, we can put it together at the snap of a finger and send it into the social media channels in, in, in Spain or elsewhere. Um, and then and a, the third tool that we have is, of course, traditional, um, uh, you know, Adobe uh, editing. So and, as well as After Effects artists and some other artists. So we actually combined all these people onto one floor so that they're all in communication with each other and we can direct them uh, correctly. So, uh, so it, it fulfills the function which everybody on this panel has already talked about, which is that you either have to be first or you have to be best, you know, in social media. You, you, you can't be anything in between. So we actually re-engineered the place to try to get to both. But, you know, um we, heard, we saw, saw the Giants videos, and there was, those were kind of, you know, down and dirty, if you will. They weren't, like, overly produced. So there, there seems to be that, that it's almost like you have to manufacture the, uh, the authenticity. You know, it's sort of like you want to be clean, but not too clean and too slick. So what, how do you kind of balance that? Because professionals, you know, want to think that it, it, it helps to do things 
properly and make things look good. So are you adding in scratches, like, you know, the Stranger Things uh, opening credits to make it look like it's old or something? Or? I mean, from, from our end, um, you know, the goal is to be authentic. You know, I think uh, when you can get something highly produced, it's, o it's always great. But sometimes the, you have other factors that come into play, whether it's a timing perspective. And sometimes you just want it to look that way anyway, just because it is behind the scenes, it is raw, it is access. And those three things are really what drive, you know, the, nowadays with sports, the NFL's covered from every aspect, right? There is no difference between what the New York Post does and what we put out from an editorial standpoint. The thing that we have is that behind the scenes, the access to our players, access to our coaches, and that's what we use to capitalize, um, to give us that little bit of advantage over every local newspaper in the New York market. I think for us, a lot of what we do is data-driven. Almost everything we, we post, um, we look back and, and decide if it worked or not. And I think what we're finding as a general best practice is that the attention spans of people are much shorter. And sometimes um, that kind of down and dirty behind the scenes look is, is what people will consume. But at the same time, they'll also consume a really beautifully um, shot piece of content. And so I think for us, as long as it's working and as long as people are watching it ideally through the entire thing, um, it really depends on what sort of we're going for. I think, you know, even with Facebook Lives, like we'll, we'll run Facebook Lives through the studio and it looks like a television show or we'll shoot it on our phone with, with an NFL player and Michelle Tafoya and they take questions from fans. I think um, overall it's really sort of uh, based on the strategy and based on what that content, what we intend for that content to do. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just got to work. If it's if a, a down and dirty version continues to work over and over and over, then we're going to keep doing that. And I think being based at a television company, um, that took some educating uh, to the television team. I mean, they would never in a million years, and rightfully so, put some of the stuff that we put out on social, on TV. It's not how people want to view television. Um, but when you have the data to back it up and show, you know, um, 100,000 people watched this video that I shot on my phone. Uh, it's, it's hard to sort of argue that, but there, there is a better understanding now of what works on social, and sometimes that's not what's going to work for TV. Have you had moments where, you know, obviously in regular production there's a lot of planning. There's getting the, you know, getting the, the satellite SNG unit and getting the, the, or the live view system kind of booked up to, to do the transmission hit. Have there been situations where people were like, just go Facebook Live, we don't have time to do that. Have you had that yet? I mean, has it occurred where something's so spontaneous that you just had to, someone had to go fire it up? And can you do that? Are you p people allowed to just turn on their Facebook Live and sort of shoot something without permission? Yeah, uh, not, not where we work, no. I think <laughs> we definitely think through everything. I don't, I don't think we're going on the fly too much like that. But there, there have definitely been times where um, we have ended something that was being shot short and we've had time with an athlete or our talent and, and we've done something like that on the fly, but that's generally still, you know, well thought out. So not, not yet. I don't, I don't foresee that happening probably at least at the NBC side. How about from the, from the league bright, perspective? It's very bright in here. It's very bright in here. You mind if I put on my Snapchat glasses? Oh, cool. <laughs> so let me just take a quick video of everybody here just a second, please. There you go. Now, uh, now, Nick Garvin's got that video. Thank you, Nick, for right. getting the glasses for me so you can look at it later. Find Nick. You can find him to find your video. <laughs> kind of interesting because the glasses actually announce that you're recording. You know, they, they let everybody know, unlike, unlike the Google glasses. So yeah. Apparently, they're dropping kiosks all across the United States, and you have to just, like, bump into one. Right. And Nick bumped into one last night. So. Yeah, it's like a treasure hunt kind of thing, isn't it? Isn't something like that's supposedly what I've heard. Treasure they, hunt, yeah. they put them in, like in the middle of national parks exactly. or something. Really, stu you know, the, the interesting thing about Facebook is we're do we're doing the D League uh, on Facebook, so the entire league, the whole, all the games are there. And obviously, the incredible power of that is that you you build with Facebook. Obviously, you need to negotiate with Facebook, a, a database of people that are tuning into those games. It's very very powerful, and, um, but. Um, the incredible thing is that because they only have to encode into a single format, right, for Facebook, I can watch the video um, uh, uh, leave um, our place, and uh, a second and a half later, it's on, it's on Facebook. Second and a half. Literally the fastest delivery in all of sports is Facebook. <laughs> so it's uh, interesting. How about this uh, VR thing? We've talked about it a few times today. So has VR 
filtered into the social world yet, or how do you look at the VR format within the social environment? From, from the Giants' perspective, uh, you know, we've looked into it, but I think our biggest obstacle is from a scaling perspective. Um, you know, those headsets to get something out to the mass, it's, it's almost impossible right now. So until we can crack away to make it appeal, I mean, it's cool to do it for five or seven people, ten people, but it doesn't have the mass appeal um, that we'd want to do across the board. We've done augmented reality. We were the first sports team to, to use augmented reality back in 2011 after we won the Super Bowl. I had seen, uh, I think it was uh, Barnes & Nobles had done something with augmented reality. So we did something where our fans could try on our Super Bowl ring um, right after we won the Super Bowl in 2011. And we had 50,000 people download the app. And you can if you go to Google and you type in New York Giants augmented reality, you'll see tons of fans that are posing with the trophy, that are posing with the ring. And again, it was, it was, a, mar it was, it was a marriage of something that fans love. They couldn't get access to a real one. And it was like a perfect social media execution for us. I think from, from our perspective, we've, we've tested VR. Um, I can't speak to it too much because my experience has been um, really using footage that's been shot for VR and then using um, Facebook 360. And so um, we've only really done it on the social side a few times around the Olympics because we pretty much throw everything at you around the Olympics. Um, but I think overall we have a task force internally that kind of looks at what is this space and, and also um, I think for us, like the, the more ways people can consume our content, the better, but I think it's still sort of uh, the jury's out in terms of how much of it. it. It is expensive to shoot. It requires specific equipment. And to Nalei's point, you know, it, the actual consumption of it once you're distributing it, um, you know, does the cost level out really? Does it make sense for us to do that? But we did do um, sort of a tour of Rio with uh, Johnny Weir and Tara Lipinski because not everyone can get Rio for the Olympics. And so it was a really exciting look. You were in the jungle, you were on the beach, and um, it didn't have quite the reach we were anticipating on Facebook, um, but it was a really cool experience, and we got to put it in front of more people on Facebook than you would if you just needed the headset. Sounds like we're all in the same, same place of, of task force uh, on VR internally. Um, what I'll say is I think, you know, obviously the opportunity to, to put a fan in a race car at 200 miles an hour probably is is um, the, the best way for us to simulate what it's like to, to, to do this. And unless you've been to a race, you've driven a stock car, uh, hard to get your, your brain around what makes this a, a sport. Um, so we think that there's a tremendous opportunity, but I think it's a, a, a little bit of a wait and see. So, you know, we've heard a lot of conversation the last couple of days and obviously the last couple of years about uh, kids. Kids today, they are all you know, they're, they're going to be cord cutters, they don't engage with the big screen, they want the small screen experience. So you are all sort of their first, you know, taste of your networks, I guess, in teams and, and leagues. So do you feel a pressure there? And how do you kind of create content for 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds when, you know, when you're not 12 or 13 yourself? And what's the challenge there? Yeah, well, we're, we're, run, we're actually running a lab, but it's only available in our international um, app right now. It's called Rapid Replay, and using the tools that I described before, what we're doing is summarizing the game in real time, right? By, by runs, by scoring, great scoring opportunities, by recounting players' statistics and just publishing the video within you know, 20, 30 seconds so that you can literally just keep track of everything that's going on in the NBA or filter it to watch one team if you wish. And then that's a subscription product. And then, and then we offer um, tokens for two games a week. So if you don't watch them in one week, they roll over the next week. You, you, you can watch all 18 of them. You can watch them all at once if you want. So, um, so the idea, it's, it's a product that we're in developing. I mean, we certainly haven't finished developing it, but the idea is that it addresses the fan that wants to check in, wants to stay close to the NBA, and wants to watch when they want to watch. So that's it. For, from NASCAR standpoint, you know, a, a pretty unique challenge. Not, not a lot of folks grow up playing NASCAR. Um, so, so trying to make this sport relatable to an 8, 10, 12-year-old um, is something that um, we wake up every single morning thinking about. Uh, at least from a social media standpoint, our partnership with Snapchat is um, a great way to do that. Uh, you know, we, we did four live stories with them this, this year that, uh, for those unfamiliar, that, that, that curated experience gets surfaced to the entire user base of, of kids across the world. Um, the numbers are, are tremendous. And how we kind of approach that is, um, you know, I, I want a kid to walk up to his mom or dad and say, hey, I saw this live story. It looked pretty cool. Take me to a race. 
Um, so you're going to see a lot of the lifestyle of what it means to attend a race, the concerts, the pre-race shows, the driver intros, the driver meeting. Yes, there's a race going on, um, and you're going to see a, a good amount of that. But unlike maybe on our other platforms, we're going to take a, a you know, a much more uh, lifestyle uh, approach on, on Snapchat. You know, what do you do, NBC? Because I know you're you're in the crosshairs. NBC, the where you know everyone's no, no one watches TV anymore. They're all watching social. So, mm -hmm. do you feel pressure there to kind of? I mean, I think it's the reality of of consumption of of content. You know, people there are a lot more ways to consume content. I think than ever before that is being reflected in ratings. But I think at the same time, and we saw this with the Olympics. I mean, people were watching. We were putting content everywhere so that we were targeting people where they were. Um, you know, we're kidding ourselves by holding things back just in hope that people will only tune in. And so I think for us, um, we want to cultivate lifelong sports fans. Um, I think to Scott's point, Snapchat is by far our youngest audience. Um, we are really in that sort of 18 to 34 sweet spot across other social networks. And so they're not too, too young. Um, but we do. We ultimately want them to really, really get excited about turning on the TV or our live streaming or watching content on social media. I think for us, it's about that total audience number um, and making sure as the, the um, landscape evolves, we are evolving with it um, so that if you happen to watch uh, a live stream on Facebook, if that's the direction, then, you know, that, that's something that um, if that's how people are going to consume content, we have to consider what is our Facebook Live strategy and that kind of thing. But I think it's really about going to where they are, giving them the best representation of what NBC Sports is all about. And ideally, they do tune in or they, they do live stream and, and um, we get those eyeballs too. So, Neela, how do you see cultivating, you know, young giant fans through social media? What's, do you have a strategy there? Do you have a plan of that? I think, that, I mean, similar to these guys, I think uh, from a platform-specific standpoint, Snapchat is really where we're leveraging all of our efforts to get that younger fan. Um, you know, the, the game of football is such a generational like, pass down, and, and we're lucky from the standpoint of the Giants. It's a, it's a, it's a family, you know, passion. So typically it's, it's, you know, if your dad's a Giants fan, you're a Giants fan. If your mom's a Giants fan. Um, so we benefit from that standpoint. But, you know, Snapchat is really our, outside of Instagram, our biggest growing platform, um, and we're continually looking ways to engage not only with content, but coming up with different strategies on that platform specifically to, to, to get that demo. Yeah, no doubt. With, with the NBA, it's not a matter of maybe finding new fans, but it's a matter of uh, alerting our fans to things that are happening in the league so we can get them to watch longer, because that will raise our television ratings. So we've actually seen viral videos actually drive television ratings. So it, it works. Odell Beckham's bedtime stories would be great for those three-year-olds, I'm telling you. Three or four-year-olds. And cheap. Because you like to read, you know, Dr. Seuss, it's a short book, right?